Welcome to the second video for Unit Zero. This one is Chapter Three. We're going to talk about cells and what they do. Okay, so the human body is made out of about thirty trillion cells. Now that is just an estimate. It could be higher than that. It could be lower than that. But about thirty trillion cells is a pretty pretty good estimate right now. There are a lot of different varieties of cells, as we'll find out this year. They are what is called differentiated. They have specialized characteristics and specific functions. So something like a neuron or a, a muscle fiber, those are going to be very different cells. So they have distinctive structures uh, within them or around them that help to um, determine what their function is. So their form or their structure determines what their function, their anatomy uh, helps to contribute to their physiology. Okay, so all cells have three main parts, the membrane, the cytoplasm, and the nucleus, the outside, the inside, and the inside inside. Okay, so this is a good picture of an animal cell, the nucleus, everything around it is the cytoplasm, and then the membrane is what encloses it all. All right, the cell membrane is also called the plasma membrane, so they can be used interchangeably. They are uh, the outermost limit of the cell, so they separate the inside of the cell from the outside. It is what is called selectively permeable because it lets some things in, some things out, but not all of them. It depends on what it is, how big it is, uh, whether it's charged or not, and so on. Okay, so the cell membrane is actually also the site for metabolic reactions that involve energy, um, certain chemical reactions. Um, and it's also responsible for communication with other cells as well. Okay, uh, so the macromolecule that makes up the majority of the cell membrane are phospholipids. One of the lipids from last chapter, it forms what is called a bilayer. Um, so again, it separates the inside and the outside of the cell. Um, the outside of the cell is going to be mostly water. The inside of the cell is mostly going to be water. Um, and the uh, phosphate end of the phospholipid is going to like the water, so it's going to orient itself towards the water on either side, and then the um, hydrophobic or the nonpolar tails, the the fats, uh, sorry, the fatty acids are going to orient the inside so they're away from the water because they don't like the water. Selectively permeable because some things can enter, some things cannot, um, so we'll talk about those in a moment. Okay, so again, the phosphate heads on the outside, the fatty acid tails on the inside, they allow for nonpolar things that the tails will like to enter, but polar or large molecules will not be able to go through. Carbohydrates and proteins might be found in or around the um, uh, plasma membrane proteins, maybe that help things to move through. Um, we see carbohydrates here that help to identify the cell and then even steroids that will help to provide some extra structure which we'll talk about in a moment. There we go. All right, the membrane proteins, we might have what is called an integral protein that spans throughout the whole membrane from one side to the other. They allow certain substances to pass through that wouldn't otherwise be able to pass through. Peripheral proteins project from the outer surface. They might be something that helps to, again, identify or maybe even accept something like a hormone. And uh, the receptors, which would be part of these peripheral proteins, um, stick out um, and would accept something like a hormone. Glycoproteins, glyco, um, referring to a carbohydrate, protein obviously being a protein. They are part protein, part carbohydrate, and they help to identify the cell. Um, this is especially important for blood types, which we'll talk about much later in the year. Um, cellular adhesion molecules or CAMs, these are um, things that are in the membrane that allow one cell to touch or bind to another cell. Okay. So these are the carbohydrates. This would be a um, glycoprotein that would be used to identify a, um, the cell. All right, so we have all these phospholipids. So it is primarily phospholipids, but it's studded by all of these proteins and steroids. Okay, there are intercellular junctions that help to connect one cell to another. There are three different main types. 
a tight junction, which we see up here, they join cells uh, together in sheets. Uh, so like our digestive tract and blood vessels where we have thin cells, that'll be important. A desmosome is used for reinforcement. So we'll see that a lot in the skin. You can see how, you know, there are all these protein fibers that help to really bind the two cells together. So that is especially evident in the skin. And gap junctions allow for sharing between cells. You can see it, it kind of forms like a tunnel uh, that goes from one cell to the other, even though there's a gap in between the cells. Okay, so we see that in the heart muscle where it's important for uh, a lot of communication between the cells so that they are uh, contracting all at the same time. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the cytoplasm, which the cytoplasm is made up of cytosol, which is the liquid part. That's mostly water. There are also some things dissolved in it like nutrients. And uh, there are also lots of organelles, which are the specialized structure that we're going to talk about as well as the cytoskeleton, which is the, um, the it, it provides the structure for the cell. So it is nothing that is in, side of the nucleus, okay? Everything except for the nucleus inside of the plasma membrane. We're gonna talk about all of these guys. Okay, so here's a diagram of a cell. We'll talk about each of these parts here and how they work together. Starting with ribosomes, this is where protein synthesis happens. So a messenger RNA that has copied a gene in the nucleus is going to take its information to a ribosome, which are these small little round structures and um, which are made out of proteins and um, nucleic acids. And they are going to be responsible for translating the nuclei, uh, sorry, the nucleotide um, sequence in the RNA to a, an amino acid uh, sequence that will help to make a protein. So we'll either see them uh, out in the nucleus on their own or studied in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So the presence of the ribosomes is what make that is what makes the endoplasmic reticulum uh, rough. Okay, so that brings us to the endoplasmic reticulum. I'm going to call it ER because that's easier. So these are membrane bound sacs and the rough ER is where protein sy synthesis is going to occur because we have all these ribosomes. Uh, and then the membrane is going to help to transport the um, proteins to the Golgi apparatus for further um, work. The smooth ER is not going to produce any proteins because there are no ribosomes. Instead, there, it's going to produce things like lipids um, and actually helps to break down certain things like alcohols and drugs. Golgi apparatus is closely associated with the rough ER because it accepts the proteins and then it is going to refine and then package them into vesicles. So that brings us to the vesicles. Vesicles help to store things that um, would have trouble passing through the membrane, but the vesicles help to transport things like these proteins from the um, rough ER um, that get packaged up in the Golgi membrane. Um, and then it will take them to the um, plasma membrane and then help to push it out of the cell. Okay, so vesicles help to transport our proteins and other things um, from one place in the cell um, to another or even to the outside of the cell. Mitochondria, pyrolysis of the cell, this is where cell respiration occurs. So we're taking things like glucose or even um, fats or uh, proteins, breaking them down and using the energy that is released through breaking them down to um, produce ATP molecules, which we can use for other metabolic reactions. Lysosomes are like vesicles, but they contain lots of enzymes that help to break things down. So um, anytime we need to destroy a bacteria or, or even break down old trash parts of the cell, lysosomes are going to help to take care. So they're like the garbage men. Proxosomes are similar, but they're a little bit more specialized. They will uh, catalyze chemical reactions that will produce hydrogen peroxide, which is toxic the inside of the cell. Um, so then we also need another enzyme catalase that will help to break uh, H2O2, the peroxide, down into less toxic things like water and oxygen. Sensor drums play a role in cell division. Um, so in mitosis, they help with uh, distributing the chromosomes, separating the two sides of the cells. 
Cilia and flagella are specialized parts um, that extend from the um, end of the cell. So cilia are going to be on certain cells that we would need to transport stuff over like mucus. Um, so we see these in cells uh, like in the throat and flagella are going to be much longer projections from the outside than cilia. You can see, I mean, think of this like grass and think of a flagella like a huge tail at the end of the cell. Um, we'll only see these in sperm cells, but the flagella is what allows the sperm cell to be able to move. Microfilaments and microtubules help for uh, structure within the cell as well as movement within the cell um, as well. Microfilaments are thinner. Um, they're made of actin. That's especially important in our muscle fibers, which uh, actin is one of the prime movers. Microtubules are thicker and they also help to maintain the shape of the cell and um, provide the movement within the cilia and flagella, that, which we just talked about. Okay, so here's our cell again. Our rough ER is connected to the Golgi apparatus. So proteins are being made with the information from the nucleus, sent to the Golgi, packaged up, and then allowed to leave. Um, the smooth ER is going to produce the um, uh, lipids, like in this cat, in this case, the uh, milk fat. We got our um, mitochondria, which is where cellular respiration is going to occur. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, so it brings us to the nucleus. This is where DNA is held. Um, so it is the going to be usually the, one of the largest parts of our cell. It's usually towards the middle. That's where it's going to be dark. That's the nucleolus on the middle of it. It's surrounded by the nuclear envelope, which is actually a double, double layer. Um, so it's like double the plasma membrane, as you can see here. <clears throat> um, it has nuclear pores that allow things to pass through, um, notably proteins um, or ho hormones, and then uh, um, also mRNA to go out. DNA is held inside. Um, it is packaged as chromatin around proteins called histones. And um, when the DNA wraps around histone proteins, it forms a structure known as a nucleosome. And if these nucleosomes are uh, very tightly wound, then that will prevent um, the, the gene, if there is a gene there, from being um, used. So if, if the gene is there to produce a certain protein and it's tightly wound, then that protein is not going to um, be made. So in that way, tight, uh, nucleosomes are going to be gene suppressors. Okay, so this is what it looks like. DNA right there, the double helix, and then wraps around these histone proteins, um, which get wound up even more. And this chromosome is not something that we would normally see, but except for during mitosis. Nucleolus is the really dense middle, really dark part of the um, nucleus, and it is really composed of RNA and proteins. It's where ribosomes are produced. So they'll be produced in the nucleus, in the nucleolus, and then sent out um, into the cytoplasm. Okay. All right, so now we got a few processes to talk about. So um, first we're gonna talk about how we get things into and out of the cell. Um, if it doesn't just pass right through the membrane. So we have two different types of transport, passive transport, which is where no energy is required and we'll get to active transport in a moment. Diffusion is the type of passive. Um, and this is where things that are able to pass through the membrane do. So non-polar things like oxygen or carbon dioxide, um, maybe uh, even small lipids would be able to pass through. So they pass through the membrane um, from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Um, so we will see, uh, you know, an area like over here, we have lots of things, uh, lots of A molecules over here and none over here. Um, so that means that if A can pass through this membrane, it will until we have pretty much an even concentration on this side as we do over here. So it continues happening until we finally get to even concentrations on both sides. Okay, so through that diffusion, uh, there's a concentration gradient, high, low, it's going to want to go from high to low. So when we say that something moves down the concentration gradient, it goes from high to low. 
Staying with passive transport, we have uh, facilitated diffusion as well. These are things that may not be able to go through the membrane directly. Um, so we have membrane proteins that allow them to pass through. So it could be something that has a charge um, or perhaps it is a larger molecule that just can't fit. So facilitated diffusion is the same exact thing as diffusion. It's just we're using a um, protein to act as like a safe passage tunnel through the membrane. Okay, so something like an ion, which has a charge, glucose, which is um, polar and also larger, as well as amino acids, um, would be able to pass through these proteins through facilitated diffusion. Osmosis is another one, but instead of the things that are dissolved, we're going to see water move through. Um, so we have things that are dissolved that just can't pass through that membrane. So as a result, water is going to pass through in order to help to balance the concentration. So just like diffusion, um, this process is helping to balance concentrations on one side to the other. Um, so if we have more of um, one thing on this side, like A, than we do over here, well, water is going to pass from the area of lower concentration, the area of higher concentration, to increase the concentration over here and decrease the concentration over here. Because when we have more water and less solute, that reduces the concentration. Okay. Um, so with osmosis, we have what are called isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic solutions. So when we put a cell in an isotonic solution, it has the same concentration on the outside of the cell as it does on the inside. So we're really going to see no movement of water overall. In a hypotonic solution, we're going to have a lower solute concentration on the outside. Um, so that means that water is going to flow into the cell to help to increase the concentration um, on the outside and lower it on the inside. That will cause the cell to expand. This could be a problem if the cell gets too big and it bursts. Hypertonic is going to be the opposite. So there's a higher concentration on the outside of the cell. Water will leave the cell and um, the cell will shrink as a result. Okay. So hypertonic, the cell shrink because water leaves the balance. Uh, isotonic, it remains the same. Hypotonic, we're going to see water go into the cell um, to, again, balance it. And that could be a problem because it could burst the cell. Filtration is one where uh, we're going to see molecules forced through the membranes. And this is where blood pressure becomes really important. Because in your capillaries, you'll have uh, really thin cells that allow, um, through the gaps, these molecules to flow. Um, but they're not going to do that freely. Um, so uh, we're going to see just the, them get forced through. So think of gravity. If we're filtering something like coffee, gravity helps to pull the water through. Um, and filtration is going to work the same way in terms of blood pressure, where uh, the water and some dissolved substances are forced out through the walls um, because there are larger proteins on the inside um, that are causing that water to leave. Okay. So if uh, somebody has a condition known as uh, edema, that is when they have too much tissue fluid because too much is being uh, filtered out. All right, active transport is where energy needs to be used in order to transport something from one side to the other. Um, so that inclu includes endocytosis, penocytosis, phagocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis, as well as exocytosis. All right, so endocytosis, these are all the processes where a large molecule is going to enter uh, the cell by a vesicle. So basically the plasma membrane pulls it in and it's going to um, essentially just pinch off into the cell and we get a vesicle. It, it requires energy. Penocytosis is really just where we're taking liquid into the cell. So this is going to be smaller. The vesicles might be smaller, but we're taking uh, liquid in. Phagocytosis is called cell eating. And this is where we're taking a much larger molecule and bringing it in like a bacteria or perhaps a larger um, extracellular molecule. Okay. So white blood cells um, are even called phagocytes and they will take 
the uh, bacteria or other things into them and destroy them, digest them. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is where we're taking something specific in. So we got receptors and they're only gonna accept certain molecules. In this case, there are these little red um, triangle things. And when they attach, that's going to activate them and they're going to pull in and pinch off just like with the other examples. Okay, so this is more specific than the other types of endocytosis. Exocytosis is basically the opposite of endocytosis. So we have our Golgi producing these vesicles and we want to deposit these proteins on the outside of the cell. So the vesicles are going to travel to the membrane, bind to the membrane, become part of the membrane, but, by, but also dumping the molecules on the outside of the cell. And okay, so proteins are released from the cell by this method. Okay, and that finally brings us to mitosis. Um, so the cell cycle is the entire life of the cell. It's the S phase, the G phases, as well as mitosis. So interphase is all of this from G1 to G2. Uh, mitosis is this, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And then cy cytokinesis is when the two cells split and become two separate uh, entities. All right, so in interphase, we have a cell, it's going to grow, um, uh, organelles are going to grow and they're gonna produce more proteins. Basically, this is the normal life of the cell. Eventually we get to synthesis. This is where DNA synthesis um, or DNA replication is going to occur. And then the cell continues to grow. And finally we will enter mitosis, which is where the cell divides and we have two identical cells. So this is gonna be a really important process, mitosis, whenever we need new cells. Um, so in the skin, that is very, very important. All right, so mitosis, we have prophase. This is where the chromatin is going to condense. It's going to package up because we need to separate it to book up separate sides. So it's like packing up suitcases. The nuclear membrane is going to disappear. So the nucleus goes away, all right? And then the centrioles, which we talked about before, are going to migrate to the poles of the cell and then send out spindle fibers. So in metaphase, the um, spindle fibers are going to be connected to the uh, chromosomes, which are going to line up at the center of the cell. In anaphase, the spindle fibers are going to pull on the chroma, uh, on the chromosomes and split them. And then in telophase, the chromosomes are going to have been pulled fully to the uh, opposite ends of the cell. The spindles are going to um, pull apart and basically uh, disintegrate. The chromosomes are going to unwind back into chromatin, as we can see there. And then the nuclear membrane is going to reappear and become the nucleus again. So now we're gonna have two nuclei and then in cytokinesis, that's when the cell is split. All right, um, so there are some problems that can occur during mitosis. Um, so a tumor is when we have abnormal growth. So usually this is when uh, a cell is just repeatedly going through mitosis, even though some of the DNA might be damaged. Okay, so if we have a benign tumor, it's non-cancerous, but it can affect the living tissue nearby eventually, uh, if it grows to be pretty big. Malignant tumor is when we have uh, something that can actually extend and move. Um, so malignant tumors are the ones that are really bad news because they can go and affect other tissues and infect them. Uh, metastasis is when cancer spreads throughout the body and can affect other tissues other than just where it originated. An oncogene is part of the DNA and they activate the genes that increase the cell division rate. So if these are turned on, and these tumor suppressor genes are turned off, which helps to hold mitosis in check, um, we could have the recipe for the growth of a tumor or a cancer. All right, so the last thing that we need to talk about are stem cells, and stem cells are ones that continuously divide 
and uh, will eventually become specialized. Um, but stem cells can become anything that um, they want to be. Progenitor cell is when uh, the cell starts to become specialized, but can still become um, a few different types of cells. A totipotent cell uh, is going to refer to a stem cell, so it can make any every type of cell. Uh, pluripotent is referring to the progenitor cell where it can give rise to certain types of cells, but not all of them. And that's um, what we're kind of looking at here. So when the sperm and the egg, um, when the sperm fertilizes the egg and we have a uh, zygote, well, it's going to start to divide and it will remain a stem cell until it starts to become something a little bit more specific. So then we get a progenitor cell, which we, which can go on and become something different. Um, so in this case, we have a progenitor cell that can go to become a skin cell um, or to become one of these neurons or one of the neuron helpers here, the astrocyte. Okay, so this is the end of chapter three. Uh, hope you found this helpful. And uh, if you have any questions, just let me know.